It's all right. Uh, indeed, so um, I'm just continuing from last time. So remember, I had set up uh, a path integral that was meant to calculate trace rho a to the n, where n is some integer bigger than or equal to 2. And so here I have n is equal to 3. And I'll call these uh, different things replicas. So I have three replicas. Um, and then you know each one of these is meant to represent the reduced density matrix where I trace out a complement. So the dotted, li the dotted line here is a complement. And then this is a here. Uh, and then this is, again, a complement. Um, and then I take n copies of them. And then I join them cyclically across this cut, which exists at A. Okay, so the cut is at A, um, and I yeah, and I join them like this. Um, and then you can think of this as uh, giving you some manifold. It's a singular manifold, uh, but that manifold I'll call M N. And then I'm meant to calculate the partition function of the CFT or the quantum field theory on that manifold. Uh, and then that at least gives me something proportional to trace row A to the N. Okay. Um, so this is the setup. Let me make a few comments about this. So firstly, um, I did not normalize. So we should normalize. Um, and to do that, well, uh, really you can think of this as uh, produce it, this path integral produces some unnormalized density matrix. So let me call that row hat, row a hat. Um, and then to normalize, I should just take row a hat and then divide by the, its trace. Right. Um, and then when we do that in this language, if I say that z of mn is equal to trace of row a hat to the n, um, then you can see easily that uh, trace of rho a to the n is just this ratio z of mn divided by z of m1 to the power n, okay? where z of m1 comes from this normalization here. Um, okay. Uh, the second thing is uh, there's a singularity. Uh, and the singularity lives at the boundary of A, so at those, at those dots here. So this singularity here. Uh, and this is actually the same as this point, which is the same as this point. So there's really two singularities in this picture, here and here. Um, and it's a conical singularity. Conical. Um, uh, which has an opening angle of 2 pi n. Uh, so if this opening angle was less than 2 pi, then you would get the standard picture that looks like this. So this is less than 2 pi. Uh, but when it's bigger than 2 pi, it's just harder to draw. But it's the same idea. Um, so in reality, uh, we should somehow smooth this out, the singularity. So maybe replace it with a smooth cone here, something like that. Um, and what happens when you do that is you introduce curvature. So there's a lot of curvature here. You've smoothed it out, but the, and so there's some. Uh, so it's a smooth manifold, but there's a lot, lot of curvature. And so when you actually go to calculate these partition functions, you actually get extra UV divergences from those partition functions, and they come from the curvature localized here. Okay, so. So this tip gives rise to divergences. Um, and this is where the area law for entanglement entropy comes from. And actually, in this case, because we're actually just calculating the Rennie entropies, we learn that the Rennie entropies have a similar divergence. Okay, And so that divergence is you know, the area of the boundary of A. Uh, you know, as I said before, because this singularity lives at the boundary of A, and then there's some UV cutoff. And that's the UV cutoff that goes into, you know, calculating this functional, uh, 
integral on this space, mn. So epsilon to the d minus 2. <coughs> OK. Um, uh, good. So the final comment is, is something that I just have to make. Uh, I am uh, obliged to make this comment. <laughs> and it's about analytic continuation. Uh, so um, remember, I, I sort of explained the strategy last time. And so the, this, the idea is that, OK, so we have this path integral on n, mn. It's pretty clear that, at least in many situations, that this will only make sense when n is an integer. OK? So it's very hard to see how you know, there's some, some cases where that's not true. But in most cases, it's very hard to, uh, to, to um, uh, just write down some general ex expression uh, or some path integral that computes the, the non-integer version. So the, the idea is that we can calculate Sn, uh, say, for all, all Zn is greater than 2, so all of them. And then we want to find an analytic continuation, some continuation, uh, which is now some function of alpha. And in general, we'll let alpha be complex, um, such that when alpha is an integer, you get back this Sn. OK? So, and then if you can do that, you can find entanglement entropy by taking the limit as n goes to 1 of this Sn. I, I forgot to write down the formula for Sn. Uh, let me just write it here. So remember, Sn is 1 over 1 minus n log this trace row a to the n. So you just take log of this Zmn, and then you multiply by this extra factor. And that's what I mean by Sn. OK. Um, now, the question is, is, is this unique? I, is such a continuation unique? Um, it should exist. It, there should be no problems with existence. And that's because at the end of the day, this is what we're calculating trace row to the n. And you know, as long as you believe that this density matrix exists, which may be with some UV issues, there might be a problem. Uh, but let's ignore that for now. Then I can just take n. It doesn't have to be an integer to write down what this is. So it should exist. I just, it's just hard for me to calculate it. Okay, so existence is not real, the real issue. It's just whether, whether it's unique. Um, and so, uh, um, yeah, so, so for example, let's say I had some S alpha that did the job, and then I just changed it to another S alpha, where I add some sine pi alpha, uh, 1 over alpha, and then some smooth function of alpha. Um, then, you know, that vanishes on all the integers. So, uh, you know. That, that, that means it's not unique, right? <laughs> so uh, vanishes on the integers. And I've designed it such that when alpha goes to 1, it doesn't vanish. So then the entanglement entropy gets a shift. Right? That's kind of bad news for us, because we're, we're really interested in calculating the entanglement, right? Some shift like that. So it seems like it might be amb ambiguous. Um, Ruling, but you can actually rule this out. Um, and it requires you to establish two things. So one I've already mentioned, so existence. Um, and in particular, what you want is S alpha to exist, where alpha need not be real. So it need, n, n in this formula need not be real. I'm going to sort of continue it to be complex. and. It exists for a real alpha and is analytic. And that's important. Um, and the other thing is, uh, is this uniqueness. Uh, well, that comes from imposing some bound. Uh, so if S of alpha obeys some growth condition, uh, in particular, it should be less than, say, some exponential of c times the magnitude of alpha, where c has to be less than pi. 
this is kind of important, this constant, c is less than pi, then uh, there's something called Carlson's theorem, which guarantees uniqueness. So these are the actually these are the two inputs of Carlson's theorem. We have an analytic function, and uh, in that in that region, the real part of alpha is bigger than or equal to one. Uh, the function doesn't grow more than this. Yes. Well, they only agree on sort of on on. Oh, very good. The question was, if I have two analytic functions and they agree on a domain, then they should agree everywhere, and that's. That's certainly true, but they don't agree on a domain. They agree on integer values. Now, that in, those integer values have a, an accumulation point, so you might s guess that that's sufficient, and that's sort of essentially the, the con content of Carlson's theorem, but the infinite point is at infinity, so it's, it's very subtle. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, if two analytic functions agree on a, on a set which has an accumulation point, then, then they, it's unique. It's not quite sufficient because the point is at infinity. So, but yeah. Um, so, but r roughly speaking, that's what's going on here. And so, um, uh, yeah. So, for example, you know, yeah. So, uh, very good. Let me not say that. But, uh, for example, sine pi alpha in this counterexample that I gave, or this problem, uh, this um, non-uniqueness uh, grows grows like e to the pi, imaginary part of alpha, as alpha goes to infinity, so it violates this bound, right? So c is less than pi, this is pi. Okay. And that's, that's essentially why that bound is there, to get rid of the, those kinds of functions. Okay, so is it true for us? Uh, the the answer is kind of, sort of, <laughs> sort of. Uh, Uh, yeah, let's just take f to be smooth. Um, what, what do you want to do with that? Uh, the question is about f. What do you want to do with f? You, you, you argue that that thing that you wrote earlier is ruled out, but there's an f there which could contribute to the growth and make it some. Yes. Um, uh, and if that happens, then uh, then it, it, it will necessarily, I guess, sorry, what's the right way to say this? Um, Um, then I can s probably, I, I forget how to do this, but I can probably, s yeah, so the question is about f and can't, can f not uh, decay sufficiently fast to, to uh, rule in this counterexample? Um, and, and I suspect if you think about it, I probably just shouldn't have written the f there, but if you, <laughs> so we don't have to answer this question. But if you think about it, then, the, the, then that f will have to, you know, it, it's decaying, uh, um, yeah, that's right. It, if, if f is an analytic function that's decaying sufficiently fast, then probably you can, maybe you can show that it, it's zero or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. let me th let me defer. Let me defer. <laughs> uh, uh, um. Yeah, so one example of f would be one of the sine pi alpha. That would be, but then that wouldn't, uh, right. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, okay, so let me, let me just defer that question. Um, okay, so um, uh, yeah, well, I mean, and, and let me sort of also hide behind Carlson's theorem because it actually t tells me that that can't happen. Um, okay, so for us, is it true? So, well, if we take trace rho to the n, if this is a density matrix in some infinite dimensional Hilbert space, then I can still, it's, it's separable, so I, I can still write it as a sum over eigenvalues like this. And indeed, this does converge for the real part of alpha bigger than or equal to one, and so it should be an analytic function there. And indeed, you can show that it's bounded uh, one actually in that region, so it does satisfy. So this this function itself satisfies those properties, and that's really all we need. Um, the, the the reason that I say only sort of is because to write this as 
a sum over eigenvalues, I need to do some UV regularization. And so it's sort of a little bit mixed up with the UV regulator. Okay, so you may, there may be some doubt there. Uh, but I think this is pretty strong evidence that it's okay. Um, okay, okay, are there any questions about that? Yes? Uh, is there a way to like, show this more rigorously at the level of operator algebra that doesn't? So, what's the question again? So, is there a way to do this more rigorously at the level of operator algebra where like, you don't have to worry about, uh, well, uh, where like the. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the question is whether I can do this at the level of operator algebras. Um, in some sense, we can't define entanglement entropy at, at the level of, of operator algebras, so we sort of shot at, at early on. But there are ways to define it using mutual information and, and some other ideas. This is, there's one, there's one that, that I've been playing around recently where you do exactly get this structure, so then it's totally fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, but there's, there's sort of work, I think, to be done there. Okay, um, all right, uh, good. So now, um, all right, so now let's go back. Uh, um, l let me, l let me uh, draw, another, draw this uh, picture again in a slightly different way. So I'm just gonna take those N copies and I'm gonna put them on top of each other like this, okay. And then I have my cut here, which I'll draw like this. Now, one thing, you know, once you do this identification that you can, quite, you can see quite easily is that I could have easily, I can easily just deform the location of this cut, right? So I could do something like this. And, you know, what this does is it reveals the second replica here, which was, you know, which was the second replica on this picture. Uh, but he, here, nothing interesting is happening. The only place that something interesting is happening is at the boundaries. Okay, so I can deform the cut. Um, at least up to, you know, up to sort of topological or global obstructions. Uh, um, and the, the, yeah, the only interesting thing is at the boundaries, and how do I distinguish some random point from, from the boundary? It's if I take a point, random point here, and I go around, I'll come back to myself in 2 pi. But if I take this point here, I'll, I go around, I'll come back to myself after 2 pi n, after I go around each replica. Okay, so that's what distinguishes those points. And so this discussion suggests we should introduce, we should think of this in a slightly different way using something called twist operators. Okay, so the idea is to replace this z of mn just by a correlation function, uh, which I'll write like this, in the presence of some defect operator, uh, which I'll call sigma. And this operator lives on the boundary of A, right, at these points. Okay. Uh, and it's a, what is it a correlation function in? Well, it's in the, in the CFT, say, or the quantum field theory, and it's really in n copies of it, right? So I have n copies, and in, in this n copy theory, I'm gonna introduce a new operator, which is this twist operator. And so what is this? So sigma g, uh, well, um, uh, the quantum, uh, CFT to the n, has a symmetry, has a Zn symmetry, discrete symmetry, which is generated by cyclic permutations. So I just have n copies, and I'm just going to cycle them around in some order. Okay, cyclic permutations, um, uh, and I'll call that permutation G, so that Gn, G to the power n is one. Um, then when you have this kind of a structure with this symmetry, you can define uh, these uh, twist operators where the definition is, um, if you go around in words, if you go around the boundary of A, you come back to yourself up to uh, an action of G, right? So you cycle through the, through the replicas. Yeah, sorry, I, I, um, it does not. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. 
this structure is mostly just study I is most is the best control is in a CFT. So I often just say CFT, and sometimes I'll mean it or not. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, okay. All right. So. Um, yes. Yeah, good question. So the question was, if I have n copies of the CFT, do I have n conserved stress tenses? And the answer is yes, I do. Yes. And that's a little bit funny, and you can fix that. Um, and I'll mention that in a little bit. Um, OK, so uh, that's the definition of this operator. Um, and you know, in D is, is bigger than two, two dimensions. Um, this, it's a non-local operator. So this is non-local. And as with everything in sort of entanglement and entropy and stuff, it's a co-dimension two object. Co-dimension two. Um, and uh, right. And so, so as a non-local object, in a so for for example, then in a CFT. It's, uh, you can think about uh, the defect CFT associated to it. And this is some sort of powerful structure that you can try to use to get control under these calculations. Uh, and, yeah. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to now move to two dimensions. Um, so in two dimensions, what is the boundary of A? Well, it w it's an interval in two dimensions. So the boundary of A is just two points, z1 and z2. Okay. Um, so I should take this operator that I defined, and I should think of it as two operators, local operators at z1 and z2. And so, and one is labeled by g. So g is is this sort of group element, and the other one is labeled by the inverse of g, just because. I have to go the other way around to cycle through the through, through the replicas. So then there's that. Now, uh, I think this was discussed by Xi Yin because uh, it's in his lecture notes. Um, the, uh, the these aren't really genuinely local operators. Uh, they're they have these branch cuts attached to them, right? And that's kind of important. They know that you know that tells you where the interval A is. Of course, I also told you that you can move around these branch cuts for free. And so, you know, that, that, that tells, you know, so what this really is in Xi, Xi Yin's language is a defect operator that's attached to some topological line operator. Okay, and that's there. Um, now, it's often convenient, and this is actually done a lot in the entanglement community, to orbifold. So what does that mean? I take the CFT in copies and I gauge the ZN symmetry. And in this way, I now have a CFT which has just a single stress tensor. Um, and in particular, I remove this uh, topological line operator. So then the twist operators become genuine local operators. Um, uh, I should say, there's a, I should just give a warning here. I won't go into too much detail, but uh, this is not always foolproof. Uh, there are some situations if you started with some, uh, let's say you take, uh, instead you're interested in you know, some state uh, which is not generated by this uh, Euclidean path integral in flat space, but it's generated by some Euclidean path integral with some topologically non-trivial uh, space, some handles or whatever. Uh, then you have to be very careful when you do this for entanglement calculations. Yes? So, I mean, you have, like, uh, and on, on the plane, you have a CN right? Yeah. Uh, a and Can you have, like, more generic types of singularities? Ah. Um, so the question was, can I have more generic types of singularities? Um, for entanglement calculations, these are the only ones, right? So this is sort of it. Sorry? So this is just like a uh, 
the, the question is, uh, this is a trick that we use. I guess it's a trick that we use, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's called the replica trick, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, so, so there, there's some warning here. So you, you should be, be careful when you all before. Um, OK. Um, good. Are there any questions so far? Yes. Sorry? Uh, you mean in the Oberfold theory? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so in the Oberfold theory, okay, I think I've mi mixed up the language here. I'm just going to call one of these a, a twist operator. And then it's a local operator. How do we call the coordination to the So what was the question again? No, it, yeah, so in two dimensions, when we overfold, we get, we get these local, local operators. Uh, in higher dimensions, then I would also have to overfold to get re really get a genuine co-dimension two operator. Otherwise, you would have a, you would have a surface, a co-dimension one surface attached to it, uh, which is just the brand, you know, the location of A. Mm -hmm. So it's the, same, it's the same idea in higher dimensions. It's just less, you know, studied. OK. Um, all right. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, these twist correlation functions and what we can learn from them and entanglement for, for entanglement. OK. Okay, so, um, all right. So in two dimensions, the claim that we've 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 come to is that, you know, the entanglement entropy, uh, sorry, the the Rennie entropies uh, are calculated. Let me write out an explicit formula as one over one minus n log of a two-point function of these twist operators, z one. Z2. Okay. Um, but you know this is this is just a two-point function uh, in a CFT. So it, let, let's also specialize to a two-dimensional CFT, uh, and so that's just fixed by conformal symmetry up to the dimension of the twist operator. So all we need to know is the scaling dimension of the twist operator, and indeed. Uh, there's a nice formula. I was going to actually go through a derivation of it, but I'm going to skip that in lieu of time. Um, it's quite simple uh, to derive uh, using sort of the state operator correspondence. So you can, uh, there are notes, and I'll post the notes so you can read about it. But basically, the input is the state operator correspondence uh, and the Casimir energy, sort of the universal Casimir energy of a CFT on a circle. Right, so the energy density, right, which is um, which is rho, is like some minus c over L squared, oh, up to some constants. Let me write them. Where L is the size of the circle. So just given these two inputs, then you can actually calculate and c. Sorry, I should have said is the central charge of the CFT. Okay. Um, and so then you can just write down what the dimension of this operator is, and it's given by this formula, is C, that's C arises because of this fact, C over 12, N minus 1 over N. Okay, so it just depends on the number of replicas. Um, yes? The, say again? Yeah, okay, so the question was, is there intuitive understanding of why the details of the CFT don't go into this? And 
I, I was trying to sort of say that. I mean, I, I, I want to skip the derivation because I, I won't have time. But basically, there's a very simple derivation. And the only input is this Casimir energy. And that, you know, that comes from uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, this, you know, the central charge in the Virasoro algebra and so forth. You, you, derive, you, know, you derive this fact using this Schwarzian uh, transformation of the stress tensor. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, you know, that's the only input. And so the only piece of data from the actual CFT is C. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the details of the Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So the question, what, yeah, what the statement was, which is correct, is that if I have more than one interval, then actually calculating this will be more complicated, and it will depend on other details of the CFT. Yeah. So I'll, 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 may, I'll mention that later. Any other questions? OK, so, so for example, now we can easily write down if, if we, this is a problem where we are setting up the vacuum on, you know, on flat R, R, R1. So if the CFT lives on spatial manifold R1, and we think about the vacuum, um, then this is just a correlation for function in Euclidean flat space in two-dimensional. Uh, and so I can just write down the answer. There's some normalization times z1 minus z2 to the power 2 delta sigma. Okay. Um, the normalization here, often you'll, you know, if this is a, uh, you know, often you'll normalize these operators, operators so this is 1. Uh, however, if you go back and actually try to calculate, for example, this partition function on this manifold, you get these divergences. And then uh, um, wi without normalizing these operators, this, this n is proportional to some cutoff. Right? So when you put that together, you can write down the uh, Rennie entropies. And you get Sn is minus 2 delta n over 1 minus n log z1 minus z2 over epsilon. So this is the cutoff. Um, and then writing this out, c over 6, n plus 1 over n, log l, which is the length of the interval over the cutoff. Okay, so that's what we're interested in. And so that's the answer. Uh, now this is the hardest part of my, my entire lecture, which is finding an analytic continuation of this function. Uh, it, right, so this was true for integer n. Now I have to analytically continue it away from integer n. And that's uh, very hard. Leave that, I'll leave that as an exercise. Uh, can take limit n to 1. And we get the entanglement entropy is just c over 3 log L of epsilon. And so this is a famous formula for the entanglement and entropy of a CFD for a single interval. OK. Questions? Yes? Say, say again. Ah, the question is, does the boundary condition, I guess, here matter? Um, yeah, so that's sort of mixed up with the UV issues. So if you want to, uh, yeah. So so it, what what some people have argued is that you know there can be corrections to this, which is just a constant, which don't depend on L, for example, and they might depend on what you insert, uh, you know, here. Like maybe you want to cut off. You know, there's a divergence here. So one thing you can do is you can put in a hard wall cutoff, but then you need to impose boundary conditions here, and yes, the answer can depend on that. But you know the interesting part of the answer, which is I guess this L dependence doesn't depend on it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Good. Now this, there's two other cases we can do really simply. Uh, actually, let me go to another board. Just using conformal transformations. So basically using the same result for the two-point function. Um, but we get some interesting physics uh, entang uh, about entanglement. So I'll go through that. Um, so um, uh, OK, so there's two other cases. So the first case is if we take a CFT 
on a circle, S1, um, in, in vacuum, the vacuum on the circle. Um, then, well, how do we produce this state using the Euclidean path integral? Well, we do uh, an integral on the infinite cylinder, right, from minus infinity. So this is, again, Euclidean time going this direction. Here's my circle. Uh, and then to get the density matrix, I need two copies of this. I put that here. This is going to plus infinity. But then I also include some cut at the tau is zero surface. Uh, and I leave that free. And this is my picture for the reduced density matrix now of this state here. OK? Um, uh, now, in terms of twist operators, now when we want to calculate the Rennie entropies, it's clearly just a two point function of twist operators on this cylinder. Sigma. Um, and we can calculate that just by doing some conformal mapping, I exactly the state operator cor correspondence. The m mapping in the state operator correspondence, if this is W and this is Z, uh, this is the, the point at minus infinity in this plane here. Uh, and then I have two twist operators here and here. And I put my branch cut here. Um, so, and the radial direction is just the imaginary part of W. Um, then, you know, then the answer in this plane is just the same two-point function that I wrote down. But then to write the answer in this plane, I just need to do a conformal transformation on the correlation function. S1, you get some factors. the delta sigma, and then you just get the correlation function on the z-plane, which we know. Okay. All right, and so let me write that out here. So the answer that you get now, um, so the map, sorry, let me, I didn't write down the map, so the map is z is e to the minus i w 2 pi over r, where r is the size of the circle. r is the size of the circle. It's 1. And then putting that together and then taking, say, the limit n to 1 after you've calculated the Rennie entropies, then you get this formula, which looks like this, c over 3 again log r over epsilon sine theta over 2, where theta is just L 2 pi over r. And it's essentially just this angle here. OK, so this is the entanglement entropy of a single interval for the CFT on a circle. And so if I draw a picture of this, what does it look like? Um, well, as a function of theta, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, then it's symmetric ar around the pi point. And it looks like this. So here, these are logarithmic divergences, um, which are just then related to the log behavior of the entanglement entropy in, va in vacuum on, on the plane, this log here. Um, and then we have this symmetric function. And why is it a symmetric function? Well, it's a symmetric function because of this purity relation. So this state is a pure state. And when you have a pure state, it's always true that S of A is S of A complement. Uh, right, and in terms of the, the entanglement entropies, um, and in terms of this function, Right, so this is some function of L, say, where L is the size of the, of the interval. Then this relation just becomes some symmetry relation. R minus L. Okay. All right. All right, and the other case that we can get is the thermal state 
can get a thermal state for the CFT on R, right, on the infinite line. Right, so again, we're going to use uh, some exponential map. So here's that. So to generate the thermal state, I have to do a Euclidean path integral on the cylinder, where the length of the single cylinder is beta. Um, but then if I also want to calculate, you know, so th this would give me e to the minus beta h, but then if I want to trace out a complement, then here, you know, I join these two together, then I'm left with this little cut here. So this thing would calculate uh, the uh, reduced density matrix uh, for the thermal state. Okay? And again, this will be L. And again, you can then rewrite this as a twist, twist operator correlation function. And the answer that you get is simple. It is C over 3 log beta over epsilon. Always have this UV cutoff. Cinch pi L over beta. And now the plot looks like this. As a function of L, L can go from 0 to infinity. There's some crossover scale beta. Here, at smaller scales than the thermal length, you know, it just looks like a, uh, the vacuum state. Uh, so it crosses over to the vacuum answer, which looks like this. And then it eventually saturates. Uh, sorry, what, did I, what am I doing? Uh, this is wrong. <laughs> I don't know why. The, yeah, it increases linearly with L. I'm sorry. Um, I should fix that. Uh, okay. So this is the answer in that case. Um, okay, so here we have the vacuum. And here, well, what is that? Well, at large L, you can see that the entanglement entropy is going like the thermal entropy density times L. So it's increasing with L. Uh, where the, the coefficient is the thermal entropy density. And so here, this is often called a volume law. Uh, and you're just, the entanglement entropy is just calculating the thermal entropy in the interval L, right? Okay. So, and the thermal entropy is just this sort of Cardi answer, C pi over 3 times the temperature. OK. Um, good. Uh, Okay. All right. And so that's sort of it uh, for, cor uh, for correlation functions of twist operators that are, that are easy. Um, there are harder things you can do, um, although it gets much harder. So for example, you could try to calculate the entanglement entropy of two intervals. Sorry. Two intervals. And then that just becomes some twist operator correlation function with four, four operators. Sigma 1, sigma, sigma. OK. Right. And so this would calculate for you S of A1, A2, where this is A1 and A2. Um, and so from the, the twist operator uh, point of view, this is much more complicated. Uh, you have to know about the, s the data of the CFT. Uh, and in fact, you, you're, not only that, you have to know about the data of the uh, tensor product CFT, say of the Oberfold CFT. Um, right. Or another option for you is to go back to this Z of MN. Right? And now this is a CFT correlation function on some non-trivial manifold. Uh, say, after you smooth out the conical singularities. And in fact, Mn is some higher genus surface. It's a uh, surface. It has genus n minus 1. OK, and so that's en enough to tell you this is a difficult problem, especially if you want to calculate entanglement entropy, because now you have to analytically continue in the genus. right? Um, so that, that makes life much harder. All right, are there any questions about that? Yeah. There should be some limits to the two integral thing that are like universal, right? Like if I make the regions very far apart, yeah. is it easy to see that that's the case? Um, yeah, yeah. So the question is that there should be some limits uh, where it does become universal. 
Um, yeah, and it, and it, it basically is using the operator product expansion. So you just you, you take them very far apart, and then you can replace these with some other operator, and the leading one is the unit operator, and then you just get essentially SA1 plus SA2 at long distances. And that's why it's often actually useful to think about the mutual information in this case, because that kills that co contribution, and then the leading correction comes from the next operator in that expansion. And you can try to calculate those. It becomes increasingly more difficult because you have to do this analytic continuation. Yes? Um, uh, your question was, why were these things inter of interest to condensed matter people? Um, I'm not a condensed matter person, so it's hard for me to answer that. But uh, one thing I can say, for example, I know that uh, some people were actually calculating this with, the, you know, they had some uh, lattice theory, and they th they were calculating because uh, you know, maybe it had a critical point in it, but they weren't quite sure w what what theory it was. And if they calculated the mutual information, they could they could see what you know, what is they could maybe extract the CFD data, for example. So that's one one application. Um, uh, yeah. And you know another thing that's quite of quite inter interest to condensed matter people uh, is um, uh, you know the dynamics of entanglement entropy because that relates to thermalization, and you can do similar computations if you're interested in some dynamical states, not just static things like the thermal state. Yeah. Um, okay, other questions? All right. All right. So um, I'm going to now move to another topic, uh, which is this uh, Rindler path integral. So. Um, yes. Can you say why are the contributions only coming from the singularities? Are there, is it contribution from the away from the from the singularities or somehow sub dominant? Or um, the, the the question was why is the contribution only coming from the singularities? I I think the answer is it's not really just coming from the singularities. Yeah, I mean there is a large term that comes from that which is this area law, this divergence. But then there's all these other subleading terms, which, which you, can, you, know, you can extract in a meaningful way. Yeah. And this correlated, the twist, twist operator correlated gives you everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, so, um, okay, so now, now we're going to switch topics uh, a little bit. We're, we're going to sort of turn to the simplest setup. Uh, which is which goes under the name uh, Rindler space or Unruh radiation, um, and so the setup is a semi-infinite cut. Semi, where I have a complement here, which is all of everything to the left, and then I have a here, and so this is going to be in general. Actually, this can be a quantum field theory on Rd minus 1. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to pick a special coordinate, which I'll call x. And a is just defined as x is bigger than 0. Okay? And then there's a whole bunch of other coordinates, which I'll call y. There's d minus 2 of them, and they're along, they're sort of into the board, and I'll just suppress them. Or if you like, I'm just working in two dimensions. So, uh, the, pictures, the pictures, at least, I'm drawing are in two dimensions. All right, and so again, say this is Euclidean time, and then this is essentially the picture uh, for the path integral that gives me the reduced density matrix on A. Okay, um, but now in, in you know uh, it's it's clear from this picture in Euclidean space, um, you know this is R D or R2 in two dimensions, and then there's clearly a rotation symmetry about this entangling surface. And I'm going to exploit that rotation symmetry and think about doing the path integral. Uh, instead of doing the path integral, you know, thinking of, slice, let's say, slicing open, open the path integral in the, in the time direction, in the Euclidean time direction, I'm going to slice it open in the angular direction. And so I'm going to draw a picture like this, which is meant to give me an equivalent uh, answer of 
but where I'm going to think about it in a slightly different way. Okay. So in particular, I'm going to use different coordinates. This is theta, and this is r. And my metric is just this. Um, OK, so let's, let's just sort of move back a little bit. So let's, let's think, let's, this is clearly something singular going on here. That's not so surprising. We've seen many singular things arise from here. So one thing you can do, as I said before, is you can just cut it out, right? So I'm just going to cut out a little section here. And of course, when I do that, I do need to impose boundary conditions and so forth. But let, let me just do that. And let me just redraw this picture uh, with these coordinates, theta and r. And then this picture looks like Um, so what does this picture look like? Well, this is r and this is theta, say. There's a little epsilon, which is where I'm cutting things off. Uh, and then I have my boundary points here and here, which are separated by 2 pi in the angular direction. Uh, yeah, let me just, that's fine. So, so this is 0 and this is 2 pi. All right, so this is the top of the cut here, and this is the bottom of the cut. And so it's pretty clear from this picture, this picture should look very familiar to you uh, from Tom, Tom, other Tom's discussion of thermal states, that this is, going, this is a thermal path integral. Right, it produces a thermal density matrix. Um, in particular, it, it's going to produce, which is then just this reduced density matrix, uh, which is what this original path integral calculated. Um, where rho a is now minus 2 pi k, where what is k? Um, well, you know, k clearly has something to do with the generator of rotations, okay? But just, just like in uh, the thermal case, this looks like a thermal density matrix, and the thing that sat there was the Hamiltonian, which was actually the generator of real-time evolutions. So what I should do is I should wick rotate. I should take theta and wick rotate. So I'm going to wick rotate. Theta goes to i eta. And then k is the generator of time translations in eta. OK? And so what do I get? Let me do the wick rotation on that metric. I get r squared d eta squared plus dr squared. This. Right. And then there's all, always this, ec this extra dimension that sort of factors out that I'll ignore. Um, but this is just rindless space. So this is, let's say, rindless space, which is a patch of Minkowski space. Right. And so the picture is here, is now sort of the wick rotation. So now this is real time. This is still x. Um, and at t is equal to 0, we can identify with uh, the tau is equal to 0 surface here. So this is a, and this is still a complement. Um, but these coordinates only cover this section of this spacetime. Right. In fact, let me do, draw it here. In fact, the coordinates look something like this. These are the radial slices. Those are the radial. This is constant r, and this is uh, constant theta, constant eta. Okay. Um, and so eta goes to eta plus c is just uh, just uh, moving up here in this direction, which is just a boost. So this is just a boost. So k is just the generator of boosts. All right, and it's a particular boost. It's the boost that you know you can identify because it holds fix the boundary of A. Right. Yes, question. Yes. Sorry. What happened there? Ah, yeah. So eta 
goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And, and is your question about theta being theta? Yeah, well, that's the same You know, if you think about the thermal density matrix. Right. You, you, you do some, you know, some thermal path integral in the Euclidean by some amount beta, uh, whereas your time is still going from minus infinity to infinity. Um, yeah, so yeah. Okay. Right, okay. And so now we can just write what, down what this is, k. Uh, and right, so k determines row a. So essentially, we're just going to write down what the density matrix is in this case. Um, So it always takes this form. So it's a generator of a space-time symmetry. So I can always write it as the in integral, say, over some time slice, t mu nu, c mu n nu, where this is the unit normal to sigma. And c is the killing vector associated to the generator. So in this case, Um, so xi, in this case, xi is just d by d eta, which is then just, in, in terms of x and t coordinates, is just x d by dt, t, t d by dx. Um, but since um, k is clearly actually only an operator in the a region, we actually shouldn't integrate this over a complete time slice. So really, we should integrate it just over a itself. So k is just that. So integrate over here. And then just writing this out um, explicitly, we get integral d d minus 2y, which was factors out, dx x t0 0, zero, where x goes from 0 to infinity. Okay? And this is evaluated at x and t is 0. Okay. Um, okay, so one thing to note about this form, just very quickly, is that, you know, rho a, let me just write it out explicitly, is minus 2 pi integral dx, x, what is t0, 0? zero? It's just the energy density, so rho of x, which is some operator. Um, and so this kind of looks like, um, you know, it's, it really looks like a thermal density matrix where, uh, you know, if this wasn't there, this would just be the temperature. So the only thing that's slightly different is that the temperature depends on x. Right? So there's some effective temperature, which is 1 over that, 1 over 2 pi x. Right? And it varies with, with space. Right? So you should think you have this Rindler cut here, um, and then the temperature, um, well, so right, the, the physics of this is that you should think about um, how you might physically restrict yourself just to ob observations in A. And one way to do that is to think about a family of uniformly accelerating observers, and they just sort of only cover this patch. I should have said that this patch is exactly the domain of dependence of A that I sp spoke a lot about before, and that's really important. Uh, and so these uniformly accelerated observers will see some effective temperature that depends on where they are, and it goes like 1 over x. In particular, you know, there'll be some thermal entropy associated with that, and it will also depend on x, and it diverges here, right? And that thermal entropy is exactly the entanglement entropy, right? Because, you know, we've traced out the left. It's the entanglement entropy between the left and the right. And so this infinite temperature is just telling you that there's an infinite amount of entanglement close to this region. Right, so that's the origin of the divergence in this language. Um, okay, good. Questions about that? Okay. Um, all right, so this is, the, the, this, I went through this um, carefully, and this is just one of many cases where you can just write down the density matrix. You can write down an expression in terms of some known operator, say the stress tensor, uh, the density matrix. So let me, um, and, and it gets a name, and the name comes from this k operator. So 
Um, if I take the log of the reduced density matrix, and let's say put a minus here, this, this object has a name. It's called the modular Hamiltonian. Right. Um, and in general, if I took some system, some quantum field theory, and I took some random region, some random state, and I produced a reduced density matrix, um, and I took the log, it would be some horrible, horrible thing. But in this case, it's the integral of something local, right? Um, in this case, in this case. And so th these cases where this is true are called sort of local. So they're, they're, they're called where, when the modular Hamiltonian is local. Right. Um, and so there's, there's a bunch of cases. So let me just list them just so you're aware. Uh, where you can do this. Um, and no, yeah, the other thing I should have said is that another reason that you might call this local is that K generates a local flow, right? or uh, some local transformation, which in this case is just a boost. Um, and so this, th this flow will be called modular flow. Um, and yeah, so and in, in this case, it's, it's local. Um, and I'm going to draw a picture of what that flow looks like in each of these cases. So in d-dimensional quantum field theory, as I just said, so this is, say, the theory. This is the cut. And this is the state. So. Uh, if my cut is half of all space, I get this Rindler and the flow, this, this Rindler wedge, which is this uh, domain of dependence out here. And then the flow associated to K is just boosts that looks like this. These are just the integral curves of that vector that I wrote down. Uh, and the state is vacuum, of course. Um, uh, in in two-dimensional CFTs, I can do better for an interval uh, I can. I also have a local modular Hamiltonian, um, and the flow looks like this. It's related to a conformal killing vector, right? So I have a conformal theory, so I now have that available to me. It's still the vacuum. In fact, this works even in higher dimensions. If I think about a ball-shaped region in a, D, in a in a CFT, there's still a local modular Hamiltonian that you can write down. And again, it always takes that form, integral t xi. I just have to give you what xi is, and I'm giving you xi in, in pictures. Um, and then there's another interesting case, which is the, the two-dimensional CFT uh, in, in, in a thermal state, but on Rd, on, on, on R. Um, and then the flow is kind of interesting. You still have this diamond, and it stays in the diamond. Um, but if you have a very high temperature, then the flow mostly looks just like time translations. You get time translations. And then as you get close to the boundary, it suddenly is aware that it should do this. Right. And so why do you get this sort of just time translation here when you're in the middle of this interval here? Well, when you're in the middle of the interval here, it looks like a thermal state. You don't really know that you're only accessing a part of the system with your reduced density matrix. So it actually just looks like a thermal state. Um, and what is the modular Hamiltonian of the thermal state? It's just the log of the Gibbs uh, uh, density matrix, which is just the Hamiltonian. right? So you just get Hamil Hamiltonian evolution here. OK. Um, OK. Good. All right. Are there any questions about that? So in all of these cases, I can just sort of write down what the modular Hamiltonian is, and then I, thus I can write down the reduced density matrix. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So let's let's return now to the uh, Euclidean path integral. Um, okay. So we have this picture. In the, in the Rindler case, we had this picture like this. We were doing this angular evolution. 
And my reduced density matrix was e to the minus pi 2 pi k a. Uh, now, oh, sorry, just k. Now I want to talk about um, purif purifications of this density matrix. So I want to understand, uh, think about the states that purify this density matrix. Now, you already know one state that purifies this density matrix. It's the vacuum, right? Because I got this state by tracing over the complement. Um, but there's also another one, which I talked about before, which is you just think of this density matrix and you take the square root of it, remember? And you think of that as a vector in a doubled Hilbert space, which is just HA tensored with its dual, right? So the dual Hilbert space. So, you know, um, vectors in this space are matrices, and rho is a matrix. Uh, the square root of rho is a matrix, and in particular, you can check by tracing out this fact, this factor here, that you get this reduced density matrix. So these are two different purifications, um, and in particular, I can give a picture for this purification. Um, it looks like this. Well, it's the square root of the density matrix, which the, the density matrix was a 2 pi uh, evolution with respect to k. So what is pi ev evolution? Well, it's just a pi rotation. Um, so let me actually draw the pi rotation. I should have, I think I got the sense wrong over here in this picture. Theta should have gone the other way. Uh, this theta is this way. That's wrong. Um, so in that case, uh, if I do a pi evolution, I just get this. Um, but this you should interpret as, you know, as a path integral that will give you matrix elements between two field configurations that are in the same Hilbert space. So this path integral produces something like phi a square root of rho a phi a twiddle. So it's this, it's matrix elements of the reduced density matrix. Whereas if I go back and I think about the path integral for uh, the vacuum, it looks like it looks like this. And now I'm going to feed in phi a and phi a complement. Um, okay, very good. So now, um, I would like to understand how to relate these two different purifications. So in particular, I'm going to equate these two. So this thing produces the overlap A complement phi A with a vacuum. Um, and so this produces some number, and I'm going to equate these things. And when I do that, the only thing I have to know is how to, to change from this field configuration in A complement to this field configuration, which is in A, uh, but lives, but instead of being a bra, is a ket. Okay, so to do that, I need a anti-linear operator. And so I'm going to relate these by that anti-linear operator phi A complement. I'll call that T. So phi A twiddle. Right. So remember, this is in HA complement, and this is in HA. So T is some anti-linear operator from HA complement to HA. OK, so now the question is, what, how, do I, how, how in principle would I construct this T? Okay. And so uh, the way to think about this is to think about a slightly different anti-linear operator that I talked about in the first lecture, uh, which acts on the total Hilbert space. So J, so I'll call it J, is defined as follows. J 
takes these field configurations like this and just flips them. So phi a twiddle goes over here, t phi a, and j is anti-linear. It's anti-unitary and has several properties that you can infer from this. The first one is that it flips A and A complement. Uh, the other one is that it squares to one. Okay. So if we can identify J, then in principle we can calculate T. Okay, and so what is J? Well, there's really only one operator that will do the job. Sorry, there's this really important fact that I didn't say, which is then, um, <clears throat> Uh, which, which is that J should also leave invariant the vacuum. All right. um, good. Uh, now, yeah, so what is J? There's only one thing that will do it. Um, J is, well, it's related to the CPT operator in quantum field theory. Uh, but instead of P, I'm going to write Rx, which is a kind of parity operation. So Rx is the parity op operation that flips X and does nothing to the other coordinates. Okay, so they're just held the same. T, of course, sends T to minus T. Um, and it satisfies these properties. In particular, it switches uh, A with A complement just because of this fact. It sends X to minus X. Okay, and it squares to one, and it leaves invariant the vacuum because it's a symmetry, uh, and it's always a symmetry of, of the quantum field theory. So based on this, we can then identify T, uh, and I won't write down the explicit formula, but I will say that this J, this is just J, will play a very important role uh, in what I'm gonna say next, and then what I'm gonna say tomorrow. Um, okay. Uh, very good. Um, now, uh, the, the one final ingredient that we need is, well, we had the reduced density matrix on A. It was this exponential minus 2 pi k, right? We also want the reduced density matrix on A complement. We'll call that 2 pi k A complement. Sorry, com I'll just call it complement. Uh, k here, remember, was this integral, say, in two dimensions over x t0, 0, 0, from 0 to infinity. Well, the complement k has to be integral from minus infinity to 0 over minus x t0, 0. zero. Right? And that minus there is just so that you get a positive temperature in the Gibbs state, uh, right? Because x is negative in this integral, so that's positive. Um, and so then um, we're going to take these two density matrices and we're going to confine, combine them in a, in, a maybe, in a way that maybe looks funny. We're going to take them, we're going to define an operator which lives on the total Hilbert space. Right, so this lived on a tensor product, say the HA complement, and this is on HA. So I'm just going to put them together, row A, row a complement inverse. Okay, so I'm going to put an inverse there. So at this point, I'm sort of implicitly assuming this is invertible. So there are no zero eigenvalues. No, I'll come back to that assumption in a little bit. But when I do that, delta becomes very simple. It kills this minus sign that I had to add there, and I just get minus 2 pi integral dx x t0, 0, 0 minus infinity to infinity. What is this? This is just the total boost charge, which I'll write as k hat. So this is the total boost operator. So delta is just then related to this total boost operator. Um, and delta has some important properties. Uh, so, well, it's written in terms of k hat. k hat uh, 
should also leave, uh, well, should annihilate the, the vacuum, right? Because the vacuum is boost invariant. Vacuum is boost invariant. And in fact, uh, this is actually, um, uh, this is essentially always the case. If I define an operator like this, delta, um, in a bipartite system, which has sufficient amount of entanglement so that these density matrices are invertible, um, then you can show, and I don't have time to do it, I'll, I guess I'll do it next time, you can show that f of delta is f of 1. Right. So it, in fact, yeah, so delta, in fact, uh, leaves invariant the vacuum. So if I was to do something like this, delta to the is, which is a boost, which is the boost operator in the quantum field theory, then it leaves invariant the vacuum. Uh, and this is the case just because of this form. Okay. So just to preview, I've introduced two objects that will play an important role. This J operator, which is an anti-unitary operator, which flips A and A complement. And this delta, which is related to this boost operator in this case. And these are called the modular operators. And this is the thing that survives the continuum limit. Okay, so I was talking about reduced density matrices here. They're uh, essentially ill-defined in the continuum limit because of some divergences. But when you combine them in this way, it turns out that you, you're defining something which has a continuum limit. Uh, and the way to understand that is in terms of these modular operators. And we can formally introduce this using this algebraic language that I had talked about before. Yes, question? <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a completely general, it turns out to a very general structure up to some statements about you know, the kind of entanglement. But uh, for many states, you'll have this structure. Um, the, the distinguishing thing about this motivational example is that it's associated to all these local things. J is CPT, which is a local operation. Uh, uh, delta is the boost, which is also some local operation. But in general, there'll be some horrible things. Um, uh, and, and yeah, so, so how useful they are in the general case is, is, is up to debate, although I think they're quite useful. Um, but you, you need to do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I'm going to finish there for today, and yeah, we'll return to this. Yes. Uh, the question was performing replica trick for high dimensional CFTs. There are some issues. Um, can I elaborate? Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, the, I think the issue is it's just less explored. I mean, I, I, you can do it, and I, I, I've tried to do it and had some success, I think. Um, but you have to confront things like these high dimensional defects. And, and yeah, and uh, I think there's an interesting structure there, um, but it's it's much less explored, and, and partly because it's a not you're dealing with non-local operators, two dimensions, everything's sort of a local operator. Yeah, yeah. Question. Are there any in two dimensions? Are there any like solvable examples where the computation of the Rennie entropy depends on the CFT data, but one can still nonetheless actually perform the analytic continuation? Uh, sorry, can you ask it? I, I missed the important. Are there any examples, say, solvable in 2D, where the computation of the Rennie depends on the CFT data? So like two interval or... Oh, yes. Yeah, so interval yeah. State? Where you can do the analytic continuation? Yeah, so the question was, are there any actual CFTs where you can do the continuation uh, in a non-trivial case, where it depends on the CFT? And the answer is yes, free fermions. <laughs> yeah, that's it, I think. Um, uh, uh, yeah, fr like free bosons, compact bosons, hard to do the continuation. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> this is, yeah.